Hello, uh, welcome to London Glass Blowing. We're going to be doing a live demonstration this evening of one of uh, Peter Layton's uh, new works. Peter unfortunately can't be here this evening, he's not feeling well. Uh, so you have myself instead, I'm afraid, but hopefully we'll enjoy what happens and a bit more understanding of the process of these blown forms. This is the range that we're going to be working on today. It looks very different hot to when it does when it's cold. So this is the finished colors, how it will eventually look. And now let's go into the hot shop and uh, meet the team. Louis Thompson and Bruce Marks, uh, both of whom have been working with Peter for nearly 20 years, at least, <laughs> man and boy. And uh, so yeah, they're gonna, the team that's going to be doing the piece today. It involves quite a few different colours, as you saw, so there's a bit of explanation about how they're put together. And uh, yeah, enjoy. The first act of getting the glass is Louis has got a blowing iron here in his hand. So it's like a hollow metal tube. The end is hot, so the glass will stick to it. So right now Louis is gathering the molten glass out of the furnace and you can see it there glowing orange. This is clear glass, it's just the radiant heat that's given off that has that orange glow. And it's nearly 1100 degrees centigrade. He's using the pad of wet newspaper here to shape and cool the glass. Very simple tool, just this morning's Metro. So now I'm gonna put a little bit of air into the glass. So like I said, it's a hollow tube. So Louis will blow down the glass, he'll trap the air inside it, and then it will be forced into the hot glass. So it looks like quite a simple technique. When you first start, you'll spend months just trying to perfect what we call thumbing in. You have to let the glass cool off before you get more clear glass on top. So you've got a stable core to gather on. So we would call that cold in that it's hard, it's not molten but it's still extremely hot, eight, 900 degrees centigrade. But like I said, you want it stable to gather more glass on top of. If it was too hot, you wouldn't be able to control it. You might alter the form or even the bubble inside could collapse. So the furnace itself, which is the sort of core point of the glass making, it has inside it a large ceramic pot called a crucible. That's where the molten glass is kept. I say it's about 1100 degrees inside. And each night we'll put more of the raw material inside, it's called a batch. We've got a very precise recipe that we buy from a company in Sweden, which has a really high level of clarity. You know, essentially from centuries and centuries ago, you might melt sand, to create a glass, but it'd be a very cloudy, dirty glass. They perfected a very precise chemical recipe to get that high optical clarity with inside it. You know, before in this country, lead glass was quite a sort of fashionable thing, and it's how you had a lot of lead crystal. And you've, there's a lot of alchemy involved within the glass process, a lot of different chemistry to sort of find what recipe works for what maker. So lead's very, what we call a soft glass, so it's quite easy to cut into or engrave, which is why you get a beautifully lead cut crystal. However, it's also then very heavy because lead is the binding agent. So it means, you know, it's, if you're trying to do something large, it becomes quite complicated. And also it reacts differently with different colors. So Peter's work, as you can see, has got a myriad of colors that generally involves reactions within the colors themselves which I'll explain a bit more later but if you have a glass that's clear that also may react you can have different things occurring so this glass that we use from Sweden called Glasmer is brilliant in that it doesn't react with any of the colors that we use plus has a really high optical clarity and is lighter than lead glass as well so you can see that air bubble sort of squeeze down Louis is going to expand that up again now. Just a simple little blow, sort of puff that back out. So 
So yeah, that's the final gather now. Like I say, it's a huge pot of molten glass inside that you dip that into to gather it out. Louis can just stop and it will pour off the end of the iron. So you can really see the fluidity of the molten glass there. So Louis is applying the first color now, which is a powdered yellow. Glass color comes in sort of various different grades. You've got solid rods of color, which is how the outside color is going to go on. This internal layer is a very fine crushed up powder. And it's all glass, it's powdered glass, because uh, it has to be compatible with itself. You find with glass, you try and use other materials, you can use sort of other metals and coppers and uh, sort of gold leaves and things. But apart from that, you'll find different things you might use with the glass. Once it cools, it'll just crack, because they have different co-expansions. Yeah, this is a very fine yellow, it's the inner layer of color. So Louis will do a few different layers of that. Basically, it builds up the density of the color. So it just depends how dark or concentrated you want that to be. And when the glass is hot, the cold powder will just stick to it. So Bruce here is heating up one of the first trails. So. You've got a yellow and an orange powdered core that Louis is being put, put together. Which... Blue. So when you look inside, you can sort of see a yellowy orange effect. And then the, the stripes on the outside are solid colour trails. So Louis is just putting on that final coating of orange powder while Bruce he heats up the blue trail. So there's three different trails that are going to be put on there. Okay. Nearly everything that we make here, the colour is the first initial starting point. You'd create the colour pattern, then you'd make the form. Very often it's encapsulated with inside the clear glass. So you would probably spend either half or even the longest amount of time making the piece just arranging the colour rather than shaping the form. Uh, with Peter's work especially, it's much more of the making time. Um, a piece like this is really quite involved. Bruce had to shape together these different trails beforehand just so there'd be enough time to show you here what goes on. This trail is very nearly ready. So once Bruce has got the heat right, Louis is going to be turning on one end. Bruce will bring the colour over. He'll be able to stick to this turning piece of glass. As it's spinning, you can just move down it and you'll get a spiral that runs all the way around it. Not, <coughs> not too fast. Which, a lot of what you'll see is they'll be very smooth, but the level of technique really takes years and years to master. Right. Is it three trails or two trails in total? Two trails. This trail actually has two different colours on. So it's green over white and a very strong yellow on the side. So that's why he's left that nice gap in the middle between the trail. So then he gives him a nice clear path to go along with. And you, because it's revolving in that way, if you keep your eyes on one side of it when you're applying it, you're able to keep position and hold that all the way down. It really is about having the temperature right, so you can keep it nice and thick, but be fluid enough to go down the whole length of the piece. Lovely. the sort of folds in the fabric now, or the, the lines in the patches. It's Bruce Scott metal tool there, it's called a tagliol. Um, the sharp edge, the soft outside skin of the glass, is able to sort of press into it, 
create a dip. Essentially, that dip, when you reheat it, will mold together, which will create a sort of creased line throughout the color. So you can see how hot it is. So because this piece has this piece almost now has its recipe in the, the colors that you're using, the amount of color they're using for that size, they figured that out. That development stage has been done. So in that regard, it's, it's unlikely to be wrong unless you put the wrong color in the kiln, say. However, with the nature of making, it could be that it, it, something goes wrong, or you get caught in the equipment somewhere, or you just you know have a physical. Exactly, the concentration levels have to constantly be on. Say the experience of these guys here means that very rarely that happens. It does happen because it's a handmade piece, and it you know human error is a part of life. Again, you wouldn't be able to perfectly replicate the way of these curves into the glass, making these indentations. You know, it's an incredibly sculptural piece. Before, these lines were being made with, with different molds, and it gave it then a very fixed look. Peter wanted it to have a sort of greater freedom, a bit more expression to it. So by doing it by hand, it creates that. And it means when this is blown out, these ridges will stick together, which okay. creates the line and the color. Uh, for me, I, I love it as a solid object. I think there's quite yeah, a lot I, of uh, scope to play with that as a sculptural form. Peter told us to almost the other day told us to stop, put it away. It looks so good. I, I understand why. <laughs> So you can see those undulations are being smoothed over by Louis now. So rather than it being that sort of amorphous sculptural form, it's got a smooth exterior, but those indentations are left as fractures in the color, which is what creates that beautiful, unique patchwork quality within it. Now he's sort of smoothed that exterior off. He's got heat right through the whole form of the glass and he has it in a sort of quite controlled form, he can start to get some air inside of it. So now he'll start the blowing process. It's glass blowing, but really it's probably called glass shaping. The blowing is the unique aspect, but it's such a small part of it. So you can see there, he's blown down the tube, his thumbs over the end of the iron, so the air is trapped inside, because the glass is hot, the air is forced inside of it and you'll just see it starting to expand and get a bit more bulbous. So yeah, Louis back in the bench using that pad of newspaper to inform the piece. start to get some air really inside that and blow that up. It also means that because it was such a dense ball, those cuts and undulations, as you blow them out, it's really interesting how you see them spread and move and change. It makes, reminds me a lot of marbling, actually. I've been looking at different techniques of marbling and now that you can do that within glass. And it certainly has that quality to me, which is really interesting. The, uh, the complicated part of a piece like this, well, 
It's got a lot of complicated parts. But right now, with Louis trying to blow that up, because he's got different colors, the different colors have got different properties. So the blue, for instance, is what we call a soft color, meaning it gets hot quicker than, say, a hard orange or a yellow. So when he's blowing it, the blue will want to expand quicker than the rest of it. So he uses the paper to try and control that so he can blow it up evenly. But they sort of pull against each other, the different colors. They have, like I say, these different chemical properties. Peter will exploit the different chemical properties of the color. You can put two colors next to each other that then will have a chemical reaction. So create a third or fourth different color just from the two. So the alchemy involved within that, again, it's a whole lifetime that you can spend just researching different colors. Like I say, Bruce has got one of the largest sort of knowledge of the different blown colors, how they react together, whether it's a solid color or a powdered color. And it's something you can just spend an infinite amount of time researching and developing. Louis is currently putting in what we call a neckline to the piece. So he's using a metal tool called Jax. And that's basically putting a stress line in the glass. It's off the end of the blowing iron. And this will end up being the top of the piece. Right now, the piece is that way round. So the bottom of the piece, see here, will end up being the bottom of the sculptural form. The neckline means you're able to break the piece away from the iron. If you didn't do that, when you were finished and you tried to get the piece off, it would probably crack. But to do it in this very controlled way means you'll be able to eventually turn the piece around to work on the other end. But we'll get to that bit in a, in a while. The next part is to use the cork to create the flat. Uh, I hope it's not too smoky for you guys. <laughs> the cork's great because it really withstands the hot temperatures. <laughs> it's a bit smoky, yeah. Staying one closer. There you go. Even for a smokehouse. Someone should have that, sorry, a glass making smoked meats restaurant. So you can see quite quickly he's created that flattened stone form, pebble form shape, which has been a theme of Peter's work for years. He's an avid beach coma. So the sort of pebbles and rock forms have been a real long-standing part of his work. But it's brilliant in that the color, once it's flattened, becomes much more visible, and I think sort of painterly in that way. It's like a 3D canvas, so you really then structure that quite chaotic color beautifully. And as it cools, you can see the blue coming back much more vividly. So there is different final tweaks on the bottom of the piece. And once he's happy, he will turn the piece around and work on the other end, which is why he's got that score line that he did earlier with the jacks. To explain, he's constantly going over to this reheating chamber. So that's nearly 1,200 degrees there, it's gas and air. And it's because the glass is cooling very quickly, you've got to constantly reheat it to be able to manipulate it again. Uh, if you let it cool too much, it would even crack. So there's a constant, that's probably the most physical aspect of the work, is the back and forth of reheating the glass. And it's the hottest that it is in front of that reheating chamber. So especially in the summer, I feel about sort of 50 degrees in front of there. Like I say, about 1,200 degrees inside. So you see a large amount of clear glass that Bruce has got there. See how runny the hot glass is straight out of the furnace. 
cools very quickly on the metal marble, which absorbs the heat. Create that sort of patty. And while it still has some heat within it, Louis is able to just press the piece into it, and the feet will be stuck on the bottom. next part of the process is what we call uh, catching a punty. So Bruce has got a solid metal iron, it's not one you blow down. Gather a little bit of clear glass to shape up. This acts almost like a bit of glue or a bridge between the piece. It's about having the temperatures of the glass just right so that it sticks to the bottom of the piece and the fracture line that Louis made earlier with the jacks, he's then able to apply water to and strike the piece so the vibration will knock the piece of glass off the iron he's currently got onto the iron that Bruce has there. This means you can work on the other end. Obviously, if the temperatures weren't right, the piece would just fall on the floor. So when you're learning, this is where you'd have your most mistakes happening. Hopefully not tonight. These two have done this together quite a few times. So the flow torch there is just isolating a bit more onto a certain point. So we've got it just right. I say, you don't want any mistakes at this point. You can see the two irons are perfectly in line with each other, so you've got that center point. A little bit of water applied to that stress fracture. Give it a little second. The moment of truth, and away it goes. So when you're first starting out or as a student, that's a very scary thing. <laughs> More often than not, it will end up on the floor. And it's just getting a, an understanding of the temperatures you need each piece to be for it to work properly. Also controlling the piece when you're taking it onto a new iron, especially with something very large. You take a 10 kilo piece of hot glass on the end and the movement can be quite complicated to control that. So you can see the opening of the piece where it's blown. The point of doing what we've just done is you can exploit the fact it's a hollow vessel and you can shape that top and make a really nice neat round hole. Right now you see it's quite thick and untidy so Louis is going to spend a bit of time using different tools to neaten that up and get a nice finish. This sort of petal form or flower head that Louis is creating will actually be removed from the piece. That's just a smaller cork paddle that Louis is using just to refine the shape. Allows him just to be more precise with the flattening. And the jacks just tighten up that flower form, create a nice neat hole as an opening. You could use the jacks to sort of force a wider opening for this sort of piece. With this shape, it's to create a nice, neat hole, so it's more of that 3D canvas stone form. There you go. That's the discarded piece. 
which you'll see as it cools what then the true colors of the work are. These sort of dark browns at the moment are actually quite vivid oranges and yellows that you see here. It's the thing with glass making, you, you might, especially when you're developing work, something might look really great when it's hot then you put it in a kiln for a couple of days to cool down slowly and it could be quite underwhelming. It might be just the fact the colours are hot that they look really interesting. but precise movements with the tools to get that really nice finesse finish. Final spin, spread the width of the piece. I mean, you can sort of keep tweaking continually. It's always the point, I think, of creating is knowing when to stop. You've seen in this process, it changed so massively, there would be different points maybe where an individual artist might want to say, actually, I'd stop there. So knowing when to finish is always the key part. Might be better to take it off here yeah, and I'll walk it over. Just need someone to do the door. Yeah. So, I'm going to walk it over if you can do the door. Sure. Simply, if the glass was left at room temperature, it would crack or explode. So that's why we have to put it into a kiln at 500 degrees to cool down slowly over two days. But that is now the, the finished piece. It's cooling very quickly. You can see those vivid colors coming back. So yeah, the thicker the glass, the longer you would cool it down. A piece like this would be about two days. If you made, say, a solid cube, that would be in a kiln for about a month cooling down. So, so a bit this more joint water. is really fragile. So again, just a little bit of water. And it just stresses the glass. And hopefully it'll just snap off this point with a little tap into the gloves. And then Bruce will put it away into the kiln. Finished piece.